Um, so my name is Dor. Um, I'm actually um, a software developer in my profession, but uh, occasionally um, working on uh, open source projects, uh, contribu contributing in my free time. And uh, I'm mostly focused on uh, improving the, the areas that basically a bit annoy me uh, when, com when it comes to uh, my own uh, desktop experience. So uh, um, from there, uh, I came to contribute to projects uh, such as uh, GNOME and uh, also uh, in the Facet world, including the free desktop SDK uh, projects. And uh, I would like to present um, an effort that uh, was done on the free desktop SDK side. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a bit technical, but I'm trying to keep it uh, uh, simple. So a few basic concepts. Um, free, desk free desktop SDK. Uh, it's a minimal uh, Linux runtime platform and SDK. It builds hundreds of Linux software projects from source in multiple architectures. Uh, we currently have uh, uh, x86, 64-bit, uh, 32-bit, uh, uh, ARCH64, uh, uh, PowerPC64LE, um, uh, and also RISC-564. Um, it's easy to consume through Flatpak and uh, BuildStream. A bit more about uh, BuildStream in a bit. Uh, it's fully reproducible, which means that uh, basically if you build it multiple times, uh, you'll get exactly the same result bit for bit. Uh, the entire runtime uh, would be basically identical. Uh, it's actually used in a few uh, projects and is quite a key component in them, including uh, it, it's the base runtime of uh, basically all Flatpak apps on Flathub and also uh, GNOME Nightly. Um, so it's quite a, a foundation solid uh, of the entire uh, Flatpak uh, um, ecosystem around Flathub, so it's, it's important. Um, it's the base runtime of uh, GNOME OS, uh, which is kind of uh, OS that presents the latest and greatest of uh, the GNOME project. Um, and also used for bootstrapping a few projects, including uh, Carbon OS, which is an, uh, another um, operating system, which it's relatively new. Uh, but uh, it tries to basically provide the, the traditional um, or replace, uh, I guess, uh, the traditional desktop with something a bit more uh, atomic and uh, um, let's call it modern. Um, so the source code uh, is obviously uh, freely av available. Um, and in this talk, I'd like to focus on the bootstrap challenge. So building software is basically um, usually not so complicated, but in some situations, it can be a chicken and egg situation, let's call it. For example, if you need to build a C compiler, uh, which is written in C, then you need a C compiler, but to build a C compiler, you need to, uh, in, written in C, you need a C compiler. So, so it's, it's basically a bit uh, like a recursive uh, dependence. Um, so, yeah, basically bootstrapping is the process of breaking such uh, recursive or circular uh, dependencies. And uh, it's important to say that Modern software stacks are actually built on many historical layers of uh, 
bootstrapping step. Uh, it's not obvious from the use of basically your distro or similar, uh, but again, the, the, the example of the C compiler written in C has to be solved, so it was solved at some point in the history of the distribution. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's no single solution to the bootstrapping issue uh, or challenge, um, which also means that projects usually expect their users to basically deal with it, find a C compiler somehow to build your uh, C compiler. <laughs> um, with that said, some projects are more considerate and do provide some kind of solution. Um, the word bootstrappable, which is not clearly defined, is usually referring to uh, projects which provide an out-of-the-box solution to this bootstrapping issue. Um, and actually, there's a community around this uh, effort to get projects to um, a bootstrappable state. Let's call it. Uh, it's uh, bootstrappable.org. You can read uh, more from information about it in their website. Um, another basic concept which is worth mentioning is BuildStream. <coughs> uh, for those who don't know, this is a tool which allows automation uh, and integration of uh, software components. Um, it is heavily based on the use of plugins, and basically plugins allow automation of various uh, uh, tasks, uh, including building, basically using all common, common build systems, be it uh, uh, Mason, AutoTools, Make, etc. cetera. Um, fetching, which means basically downloading, and tracking, which means keeping up with uh, source files of various uh, uh, types, basically being able to automa automatically detect uh, new versions of projects and fetching their sources and basically allowing uh, sort of uh, continuous integration of, uh, of uh, um, integration of new versions of projects. And one important uh, part in, in BuildStream is that its uh, build environment is entirely sandboxed. So uh, only what is defined to be part of this sandbox uh, would actually exist uh, during the build. And this is for every single component being built. So the set of build dependencies both clearly defined and also very minimal. You, you only, the, the uh, let's call it the build system, uh, always sees what you want, what you expose and nothing else. Um, it also has uh, built-in support for artifact caching, which means um, when you build something, and for example, I don't know, uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, GDIP, um, then the result of that build is cached in a way which can be shared with others. So uh, when you have a central cache server and you'd like to build a project based on build stream, um, then what you get is basically um, a sort of, uh, cache hits or cache misses on each component that you, you want to build. And if you have a cache hit, then you get the, um, the artifact, the final build product uh, downloaded instead of built. Um, there's also local caching. So if you build something then, uh, and nothing changed, then you already have it uh, cached. So it doesn't repeat the builds that aren't necessary. There's also source caching, which is uh, similar to artifact caching, basically uh, the process of fetching the source um, also uh, is able to cache it and then 
you can from a, from a center location get uh, the source file for the entire project without having to access a few dozen uh, different uh, websites to, to get the necessary source files. Um, it also allows uh, mirroring of sources. So uh, for the, cache op the fetch operation, sometimes uh, uh, some website which hosts some tarball that you need is not going to be available. And if you have a mirror set up, then uh, it, it will be. Um, and BuildStream is used to build uh, the free desktop SDK project. Basically, the entire software stack of uh, free desktop SDK is defined using uh, BuildStream elements. Um, and you have, uh, it has a, a website you can see uh, for more information about it. So now that you uh, are familiar with the basic concepts, let's dive into the um, basically the the issue that uh, the effort uh, was trying to to solve. So let's uh, go over the design, a high level design, and a few limitations of free desktop SDKs bootstrap. Um, so if you look here, you see a very high level uh, dependency graph or chain of the Flatpak uh, ecosystem, uh, at least in FlatHub. Um, you have the, basically, all sorts of, uh, if, if we start at the bottom, actually, you have the free desktop SDK runtime, which is basically provide, provides the, the minimal um, um, environment for, for, for building and running software. Um, uh, and basically the flat packs themselves. Some flat packs are built directly on this runtime, I think most. Uh, for example, the Steam uh, flat pack would uh, use a, a, the free desktop SDK runtime uh, directly. Um, and then you have some, what we usually call downstream runtimes. So for example, the GNOME uh, 44 runtime or KDE runtime. Uh, are each built upon the free desktop SDK runtime in a way uh, inheriting uh, it as a base runtime and adding additional components on top or replacing some components with other versions, etc. cetera. So uh, then you have obviously the, the apps, uh, the GNOME uh, Flatpak apps or, 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 or KDE Flatpak app, which build upon these. Uh, what you don't usually see when developing uh, flat packs is uh, actually this this layer. Um, free desktop SDK needs to be built it somehow itself. So the design is that free desktop SDK, for example, here we have uh, the 22.8 runtime built on the 21.8. Uh, uh, eight, uh, runtime, and then uh, this one builds on top of the uh, free desktop SDK 20.8 uh, runtime, which just continues basically. Uh, and if we look at this uh, basic uh, um, dependency graph, you, you see that uh, eventually we, we reach after four or five versions the free desktop SDK uh, 1.6 runtime, which itself is built on the Yocto project, which itself is built on something, I guess. But uh, it, it, this chain just continues. And um, this is something which uh, has issues uh, that we'll discuss. Um, but the issues start here, so, so let's focus on, on, on this part. Um, if we look at how the free desktop SDK uh, is, is built, you see that, uh, for example, in order to build free desktop SDK version N, then you need N minus one, the one before it. And the way it works is you have three basic uh, high-level steps. 
you cross compile tool chains. Uh, basically all the architectures you'd like to be able to build. Um, you build the project natively, which means all the hundreds of uh, elements that uh, uh, I, I mentioned before uh, that uh, are part of this, are built by the free desktop SDK project. And then you extract a subset of these elements, uh, these components, into what's called a pre-bootstrap um, image, which is its own uh, small runtime, let's call it, uh, which is then used to be a, as the, the basis of the bootstrap of the uh, free desktop SDK version N in this case, uh, which repeats the same uh, steps, basically waiting for uh, free desktop SDK N plus one, which will take the pre-bootstrap image and use it as the basis for uh, its own bootstrap. So you can see that this is basically uh, very repetitive uh, and built in a, a bit of a recursive way. Um, and this is actually very common to see. Um, there are many distributions which are built uh, in a similar way. And uh, what we are trying to do here is, is improve this a bit um, because it has a few limitations. First, the dependency graph is not clear. I mean, as, as you've seen, my, my graph ended with a question mark because obviously uh, I could have gone and uh, investigated the entire uh, chain and maybe was able to, to find whatever uh, uh, Yocto is uh, bootstrap from and then whatever that one is bootstrap from, but uh, this is not something which is uh, reasonable to, to expect from uh, someone which is interested uh, in, in learning the dependency graph. So it's, it's not clear at all, uh, which means that uh, basically it can't be audited um, I will not discuss the security implications of this, but in a way, uh, there are some both theoretical and practical, um, let's call it uh, attack vectors, uh, which propagate some kind of malicious code up the uh, dependency graph, and when you can't audit it, you have a uh, possibility that this is uh, something that you have in your dependency graph, so, but, but this is not the, the focus, let's call it. Um, another thing is that you can't build a project from source code alone, because you always need the pre-bootstrap image, which is a set of binaries, uh, including, you know, a shell and um, some uh, build uh, tools and etc. So, you, you always have to have that image uh, at, at every step uh, on, of the boot, bootstrap until you reach, uh, basically, as, I, as, as I've, I've mentioned, uh, areas which are not entirely mapped. So uh, this is uh, not good. Uh, and you can't expect also someone to build so many steps to reach the, the latest versions if they would like to be able to build the project from source code. Um, and also the pre-bootstrap image in itself is a, is a single point of failure, which means that uh, the bootstrap path uh, heavily depends on, on, on it. It's, it's a set of large, it's a basically a big image of binaries, uh, uh, I think uh, at least 100 megabytes. Um, and these images are hosted on Free Desktop SDK's release server, which is basically where the uh, continuous integration pipeline pushes uh, releases um, when they are made. Um, and if we stop for a moment and think what would happen if an image like this is lost, for example, the release server is gone for some reason, then uh, 
it's, it's actually a bit of a catastrophe because uh, the bootstrap path breaks and the free desktop SDK project essentially becomes unable to build. And it actually happened multiple times. Um, but yeah, some, some ways to work around this uh, were found, including uh, finding uh, something which was cached in a local machine, which was enough to, to restart the bootstrap process. And obviously, this is not a sustainable solution. So in a way, uh, I don't know if you know this uh, XKCD uh, comic, but um, it says all modern digital infra infrastructure. You see this large, uh, uh, what appears like a building or, or large columns of, uh, of many components, and they're all basically uh, reliant on this one uh, random uh, project uh, which someone, one person maintains and you know, everything is built upon it. Uh, so we can basically uh, do something like this and say that all flashback apps uh, are basically dependent on the free desktop SDK release server. And when it's gone, all flashback apps are also gone, uh, which is not good. So the main purpose was being able to overcome this uh, limitation or design limitation. So the new design, its goals, break the recursive dependency on previous versions of free desktop SDK, have a clear and simple dependency graph uh, of the bootstrap, use minimal binary seeds for the bootstrap, and build, build all non-seed binaries from source. So a seed is basically what you start with. So the seed, um, in the case of uh, the design that I've shown, uh, was the pre-bootstrap uh, uh, image. Um, and allow auditing of all source files. Um, and finally, of course, maintenance should be easy and automated as much as possible. Uh, the last uh, uh, point is mostly about having this well integrated within the uh, build stream uh, Let's call it a setup that we have in free desktop SDK. Uh, the, f the benefits, uh, the entire bootstrap path is documented and auditable. Uh, the project can be built and reproduced from source code alone, and it's easy to bootstrap new architectures. So this is basically the new design. You can see that it doesn't end in, you know, three dots. Uh, because it ends there. We have the free desktop SDK basically dependent only on a single uh, project called the free desktop SDK binary seed, and, and that's it. Uh, there's, there are no additional steps. You need only this one. So uh, if you look at, if we zoom into it, um, the free desktop SDK binary seed builds a project called Live Bootstrap which, uh, and, and the next step, I will mention what Live Bootstrap means, but and the next step is to cross-compile toolchain, and then in Free Desktop SDK itself, we build additional tools, basically auto tools and, and some uh, build, uh, uh, um, build system, um, and cross-compile uh, again a few toolchains. This allows us to expand a bit further and then build the project natively. If you look at the targets, uh, target architectures, then Live Bootstrap is limited to x86. It can only be built on x86. So from x86, we co cross compile basically as much ar architectures as we want. Currently, we have the, the three that are mentioned. Um, and then we have basically free desktop SDK run natively. Uh, build natively for each architecture. And this is where the additional tools are built. And finally, we have an, an additional cross compilation step which allows us to expand the uh, architectures further. further. Um, it's, uh, uh, the description, 
this discrepancy between the cross compilation steps are basically uh, just an, uh, uh, an optimization uh, in a way. We, we only want to build in the seed what we can actually run natively. Um, and then step number three is build the entire uh, free desktop SDK product. So uh, there are a, a, a few caveats. Um, Rust can be bootstrapped from, from source, and it's, it's just not simple. Uh, I'll mention it. Uh, some host tools are still used by Buildstream itself to fetch so sources, so um, base and, and set up the build environment. So uh, this is not a, an entirely purist uh, source only approach, but it's, it almost is because in the sandbox, in the sandbox, build sandbox itself, we are not introducing any kind of binary at any step. Uh, which is not the seeds themselves, the, the, the intended seeds. Um, so live bootstrap, it, it does kind of look like the, the um, magic behind this all, so it is. What is it? So it's a project uh, started by uh, uh, Fossi and Andreas um, back in uh, December, uh, well, this initially uh, published in December 2020. Um, it is actively maintained and expanding. Um, it builds upon the immense efforts of the Bootstrapper Will build, build community, which I mentioned before. By the way, there is an IRC channel that uh, you can uh, join uh, to, to um, look at discussions. Um, and it bootstrap, as I said, only at 86, and it relies on a one kilobyte binary plus a Linux kernel uh, and, and builds from scratch uh, using those. There's actually an effort to increase the binary a bit but reduce, basically remove the Linux kernel dependency so you have a single three kilobyte binary which bootstraps uh, the entire live bootstrap project uh, which when it, it's, it's build ends, it, you have a fully uh, working x86 uh, system, uh, obviously very minimal, and it supports actually multiple bootstrap modes, uh, bare metal, so you take a, a, a PC or something and um, give it the, the seeds and the sources in a specific layout, and then it just uh, uh, given, obviously, the Linux kernel at right now, but soon, not even that, uh, you get uh, a fully working system from that. Uh, there's also QEMU and Bubblewrap and uh, Truth. Um, so how does it work? Uh, early bootstrap steps build on projects dedicated for bootstrapping. So there's the stage zero POSIX and the GNU mess. I will not go into details, but they are basically helping bridge the gap um, of the early bootstrap steps. How do you uh, uh, basically uh, get to uh, a working C compiler from without, uh, which is written in C, but you don't have a C compiler. So this is uh, a very technical uh, uh, concept which uh, you can dive into if, if you'd like, but I'd like to focus on the high level. So. Uh, later steps uh, basically usually follow a historical path. So what it does is it builds old projects. Uh, luckily, old projects are usually bootstrappable in themselves because when you start a build system, you usually use some other build system to build your own project. Or when you start a compiler, you usually start uh, with writing your compiler in different language, so they begin uh, bootstrappable, but then uh, sometimes on the way lose that uh, quality. So um, it actually starts with projects from the 90s and early 20s and gradually gets to uh, 2023. So uh, it's an interesting thing to see building. Uh, patching and workarounds are used when needed, um, especially in early bootstrap because some components are built partially 
For example, uh, Bash is built, but without in interaction, uh, it's interactivity, um, and some other uh, tools are basically built partially just to uh, be able to progress. Um, and the entire bootstrap chain is well documented um, in, in the source code, so we can look basically and see that uh, all the steps you see from zero to, um, there are many steps, uh, 139. So all of these are basically documented, uh, both in code and in, in this uh, file. Um, um, so this project had gaps. Uh, bootstrap software is too old uh, to bootstrap uh, Redusted with decay. Basically, for example, the uh, GCC version wasn't uh, new enough uh, to build components in Redusted with decay, and building in Buildstream was basically not possible because all Bootstrap modes required root, root permissions. So we've had we've we've been working on improving that. Um, I will skip a bit over this. Uh, quickly uh, uh, due to time constraints, but uh, um, so Live Bootstrap itself needs uh, needed a modernization and some improvements, including addition of dynamic linking support for uh, Muscle, which it uses as its libc. Um, uh, final libc, but basically it has a few libcs that it uses along its Bootstrap path, but it ends with a muscle. Um, also, modernization of uh, uh, the components. So w the bootstrap ends with Python, uh, GCC, and Binutil, and auto tools from, uh, let's say, around uh, 2022 or 23, which is uh, good enough. Uh, and many bug fixes and improvements were made. Um, Additionally, Lab Bootstrap needed some preparation for being able to build in Buildstream. Uh, so what was added upstream to Lab Bootstrap was a boot bubble wrap based Bootstrap mode. Bubble wrap, I will not go into too, too many details, but basically it's a tool that allows setting up sandboxes, uh, which Buildstream uses uh, for its uh, uh, build sandbox. So having that in Live Bootstrap itself helped uh, avoid the need, for example, for root permissions um, to, to build the, the Live Bootstrap uh, project. Um, the build environment, as I said, is similar to Buildstream. Um, some simplification of the project uh, directive structure. You need to remember that we start with nothing and end up in a fully working system. With nothing, I mean, you don't even have the ability to remove files or copy files or read files or anything. So uh, it's the, the directive structure becomes a bit uh, of a challenge. So some simplifications was made there uh, to avoid the need for heavy preparation, let's call it, of the source. And uh, support for generating source manifest. So basically get, as I said, build team can track uh, projects, but this is a bit of a um, unique project in a way that it has many sources, it builds many projects, so having it export its uh, sources, uh, source files, basically, the, the source file that it uses, not its own source, uh, was needed. Uh, and avoiding the use of truth uh, during the bootstrap, which is part of the, um, basically, looking, make, making the uh, build a bit more like what we have in Buildstream. Uh, the FreeDust of SDK binary seed project was added, which builds lab bootstraps and extracts a few packages from it, um, cross compiles uh, the native tool chains, as I mentioned, and uh, finally builds Docker images for easy consumption by FreeDust of SDK. Um, some plugins were added to uh, Buildstream to be able to. Uh, both work with Live Bootstrap itself and also perform the 
the bootstrap uh, process. Uh, for example, we needed a, a, an element, a Billstream a plugin that executes the sigun command because you don't have any shell, for example. Uh, when you start the bootstrap, you just have the binary uh, seed, the one kilobyte seed. Uh, you need to just execute it. Uh, so it needed uh, its own element. And its source code is available, freely available as well. Um, and then finally, uh, in, the, in the free desktop SDK side, use this seed, make any adjustment that I mentioned in the design. And um, basically, because we are expanding the, the number of uh, tools built uh, as part of the, the pre-desktop SDK itself, we needed some optimization and reuse of components, so it's not restructuring, restructuring was made. Um, so implementation status, uh, all the changes that I mentioned were merged upstream. Uh, the upcoming free of SDK uh, 23 uh, will be bootstrapped from the new binary seed project from live bootstrap, essentially. And actually, it was already backported to the current stable re release uh, due to, uh, as you as you <laughs> as I mentioned, uh, we, we had issues, hardware issues in our release server, so the risk did become unbuildable, and uh, that was a good excuse. So we do, uh, the, the last three releases actually are already bootstrapped from uh, Live Bootstrap. Um, and basically this effort was made uh, with multiple people, uh, special thanks with no spe specific order uh, to the maintainers of, na maintainers of the Live Bootstrap project and also uh, uh, Stepo from uh, the Free Desktop SDK project, which uh, contributed a lot of the changes. Uh, future work, uh, I will not go into details here, but basically automated source mirroring of live bootstrap sources. So it uses some really old sources from the 90s, and if they are gone again, the bootstrap path is gone as well. So we need to have some kind of uh, mirroring for this. This is not done yet. Um, uh, we can use uh, Lori which is also used in, in the GNOME project from the uh, to be build the uh, GNOME build meta project and to find a solution for Rust. Uh, Rust basically always builds its latest uh, stable version using the previous st stable version, similarly to what Freetest of SDK was using, uh, which makes it uh, very hard uh, to bootstrap you basically need, there, there are a few potential bootstrap paths for Rust. Uh, M Rust C is the basically most progressed one, let's call it, but it's still not sustainable. You need uh, 17, at least 17 steps of building Rust uh, over and over um, in order to get the latest version. Uh, M Rust C is basically itself built using C, so given C compiler, you can basically build a very old version of, of uh, it's not exactly the Rust, it's a, a Rust compatible compiler. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Test, yeah. Uh, I had many questions during the talk. There was a lot of uh, things covered and I forget them all one by one. Um, <laughs> but I will try to remember and come to you afterwards. So it's not really so much of a question right now, but more, uh, yeah, a big thanks because despite the fact that I'm wearing a free desktop SDK t-shirt, I had no idea how the, all of this works and how much work was involved in there. Yeah. It's uh, a bit overwhelming. 
Um, yeah, so thank you and everyone I involved, and also thanks for, for sharing. It was a really good talk. Thank you. Any other questions? So thank you very much. Thank you.